Well, talk about God using um, people who aren't terribly obvious. Um, I've been teaching for 31 years. That's pretty good. God's, God, God's, God's a graceful. Praise to God. Uh, but God is certainly graceful. As a matter of fact, if my buddies in the neighborhood saw me, knew that I taught Sunday school class, they, they'd probably laugh. No, I don't believe it. Uh, so I'm thankful for that. Uh, well, today we're going to take a look at a few themes in 2 Samuel. We're getting into some real nitty gritty stuff. So let me uh, go through with you today because we'll go through four themes. Um, and the first thing is D David attempting to bring the ark back to Jerusalem, but he fails. Now, why is it out of Jerusalem in the first place? Why is it out of Jerusalem in the first place? Yeah, Alvin. Because he was taken by the Philistines, and then God troubled them enough that they sent him back. Sent him back. So they didn't get all the way to Jerusalem. They sent it to the five capital cities of the Philistines, and all of those, uh, all of those cities experienced the same thing. Do you remember what they experienced? They were overrun with rats. And, and they had another condition uh, called tumors, but really, what were they? Hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids. Uh, right. so, so that God, you know, God's got a sense of humor. <laughs> yes. And, and their big idol lost its head and hands. Over the yeah, that's right. Um, so anyway, they're coming back to Jerusalem. He fails the first time. He succeeds the second time. Then we'll see David entering the city. And he'll gather the people to worship. Um, and, and, and really, all of that anger is his wife, Michael. And we'll talk about his wife, Michael, as well. But God makes a promise, thirdly, um, to David through Nathan. And then David prays. And finally, God delivers on his promise to David. So we'll go through it. But we'll start with David's attempt to bring back the ark um, and, and his failure. And then the second... Uh, time his success. So he gathers 30,000 young men. And, and, and some translations read choice men rather than young men, or able men rather than young men. Um, Jack, let's do 2 Samuel 6, 1 and 2. David again brought together out of Israel chosen men, 30,000 in all. He and all his men set out for from Bela of Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. So the 30,000 men are gathered and they're marching for what purpose? <coughs> for what purpose? Huh? What, what, what purpose are they going? Why are they marching? Why are they been assembled? I can't hear it. To bring the ark home, that's right, okay? So, um, and, and really this was a part of establishing really a central place for worship in Jerusalem. And, and, and really, I thought about this and I, and I wanna ask, were the 30,000 men, warriors, his best men, were they there for show or for protection? For show or protection? What do you think? Both. Huh? I think both. Because it, it, it's, it's a triumphant, uh, it's a triumphant feeling to see the chosen military men, but also they were having full protection to protect the ark. Yeah, in case they were attacked. They were attacked by the Philistines, and the Philistines grabbed the ark. So it really was for protection, but I think it was also to teach. And I think David wanted to teach these men and everyone else a certain amount of reverence for the ark. Does that make sense? Why would they have reverence for the ark? Why would they have reverence for the ark? Go ahead. It house the presence of God. And, and by the way, why are they bringing the ark back to Jerusalem? Now, now, at this point, they don't have a temple in Jerusalem, but what do they have? What do they have? They don't have a temple, but they have something else. 
David constructed the tent they put in because they didn't bring, take it back to Shiloh where it had come back. So the, so the tent is really a tabernacle, okay? And inside the tabernacle, there is the holy place and the most holy place. The most holy place is where the ark resides. And by the way, there are two angels on each end of the ark. And on top of the ark, the cover, the lid is called what? The mercy seat. And the high priest would go in there once a year and sprinkle the blood of the lamb on the on the mercy seat seven times okay so so he wants to teach a lot of this and with all these precautions let me ask you first why did david fail the first time why did david fail the first time go ahead terry the levites that god prescribed to to transport the ark and one of the men reached out and touched it exactly exactly so so the ark had been in the house of, uh, of Abinadab for 20 years. And his sons put it on an ark or put it on a cart. And it was a brand new cart, of course. And they drove it. And, and bringing the ark back to Jerusalem was certainly a good idea, wasn't it? It was a good idea. We're going to put it back in the central place of worship. And, and, and David makes it a big production. Okay, 30,000 men. There's music. There's a new cart. Uh, there's all of this drama, and, and and so this is really clearly a big production, and they also had power and authority along with it. Who? What do you mean power and authority? What well, was King David was there, and and it likely made them feel really good, but God didn't want this big production, did He? You no, know, God didn't like this big production. Why is it a problem? Well, let's go back. It was contrary to God's command, as Terry said. Exodus 25, 12 through 15, Jack. Cast four gold rings for it and fastened them to its four feet with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the sides of the chest to carry it. The poles are to remain in the rings of this ark. They are not to be removed. So the ark was to be carried by hand with poles, and only by Levites. But instead, they put it on a cart. Listen to what David Gusick said. Jack, can you read that? Much service for the Lord is like this. A new cart, a big production, with strength leading and friendly, uh, with strength leading and friendly out front, yet all done without inquiring of God or looking to his will. Surely David prayed. But he didn't inquire of God regarding the production itself. This was a good thing done the wrong way. We're often tempted to judge a worship experience by how it makes us feel. But when we realize that worship is about pleasing God, we are driven to his word so we can know how he wants to be worshiped. Oftentimes we focus so much on the production that we forget about God. But let me come back to something. The Jews put the cart or put the, put the ark on a cart. Well, didn't the Philistines do the same thing when they returned the ark? Didn't they do the same thing? Well, why didn't they get zapped? Huh? They weren't provided the instruction. So they didn't have the instruction in advance. By the way, does any of this sound familiar, particularly with what's going on here, the big production, the music, all this stuff? Have you ever known people who go through kind of Christian motions as they sin? You ever known people who go through all the Christian motions, have all the Christian stuff, they, they speak in the Christian vernacular, okay? Bless his heart. <laughs> they, they do all of that. Okay, let me give you an example. When I was a high school administrator and a coach uh, in a Christian school, one of, one of the girls there, nice girl from what I thought was a pretty nice family, got pregnant by one of our players. And clearly her family was embarrassed. You could imagine, upstanding Christian family, their daughter gets pregnant. Well, then the girl's mother 
shared something with me and she wanted to share with me what she called the redeeming value of the event. And evidently, both of them prayed before they had sex. Really? Really? What do you think about that? Yeah, that's right. Huh? Okay, you can't can really apologize before you commit a sin. You can't be like, I'm sorry for doing this, and then go ahead and do it because then you're not truly sorry. But don't they do that? Or oftentimes they'll do, we'll commit sin. We know it's sin. We're going to go do it anyway because God will forgive me anyway, right? I mean, I don't think we intend to do it. It's not intentional, but things happen and we do things. Like, like what? <laughs> 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 all right i'll move on <laughs> but but here we have david and david is going through all of the spiritual motions but he's committing a sin is he not and and it may be a, you might call it a sin of omission or a sin of commission whatever you call it it's still a sin and, and he ignores god's command but god doesn't ignore his command and 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 Really, what happens next is the, the oxen stumble. Uzzah reaches back, puts his hand back there, and, and he's trying to stop the ark, which is a almost a reflex action, and zap. He's killed. By the way, zap, what's that called? Onomatopoeia. Do you remember? I think, how many remember onomatopoeia? I remember the word. Zap. I, I should draw it on the board, zap. But anyway... Zap, he's killed. And, and let's take a look at 2 Samuel uh, 6, verses 6, 7. Tony. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. So it's telling us that Uzzah disrespected God's command. And that command is in Numbers 4.15. Jack, can you read that? It's, on the, it's on, the, uh, on the board. After Aaron and his sons had finished covering the holy finish furnishings and all the other, uh, and all the holy articles, and when the camp is ready to move, only then are the Kohathites to come and do the carrying. But they must not touch the holy things or they will die. The Kohathites are to carry those things that are uh, in the tent of meeting. Now, who are Kohathites? Who are Kohathites? You ever heard of them? Yeah. Huh? Huh? They're priests. They're, they're Levites, but they're also priests. All right. And so they got lots of different names. But the fact of the matter is, he is being clear in terms of his instructions on what they're supposed to do. Now, <clears throat> when it happens, when Uzzah gets zapped, David's really angry about that. And, and he's confused by that. Can you imagine? And so he questions God in, in 2 Samuel 6, 8, 9, Jack. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? So, so can you hear his, he's, he's perplexed here and he, somewhat frustrated. And he says, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? David knew that his desire to bring the ark back was a good desire. It was a godly desire. And it was God's intention as well. And, and, and he wanted 30,000 men who were with him, and as well as all of Israel, to be aware of what's going on, how special this ark is, what's happening here. We're bringing it back. But David's action for the rest of the chapter now, tells us that God did answer his questions, did respond to him, and did tell him why. It doesn't say that, but we're pretty sure he figured it out because he tries a second time, and this time he succeeds. But initially, David stops moving the ark, and he stops moving it into the city. In fact, he left it there for three months, and it was in 
a Gittite's house. Now, 2 Samuel 6, 10 through 12. He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went down and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. Right now, what's a Gittite? Anybody know what a Gittite is? Well, they were men of Gath. Who else was a man of Gath? Goliath. Goliath is the man of Gath. In fact, they were mostly in, the, the Gittites were mostly Philistines. And the, and the town happens to be in Philistine territory. So why would, he, why would he take the ark to a Philistine? Well, the other part of the story is, remember what I said earlier, that they assigned what I'll call missionaries, Levite missionaries, to certain towns and cities surrounding, some of which were in Philistine territory. And Obed-Edom is really a Levite. He's not a Philistine. And he was there to live in this location. And essentially, they were missionaries uh, of sorts, um, almost evangelists. And his descendants are listed, by the way, in First Chronicles uh, 26.4. Did I give you that one, Jack? Yes. Okay. Obed-Edom also had sons, Shemaiah, the firstborn, Jehozabad, the second, Joha, the third, Sekar, the fourth, Nethanel, the fifth. And they were all gatekeepers, it says. So what were gatekeepers? Anybody know what a gatekeeper was? Well, they guarded the city gates. They guarded the city gates and they guarded the temple. Okay, interesting. Can you see the religious influence here on society? In other words, in that society, uh, there's no such concept, particularly in Israel, of the separation of church and state. Is there? Well, the separate course of separation of church and state is in our constitution, isn't it? Huh? What do you think? What do you think, kids? Is it, is it in our constitution? Where did it come from? Where did it come from? Thomas Harrison wrote a letter. And it was for a church. The government was trying to impinge on the church, and, and he actually said there is a separation here. The government cannot impose on the church. We have totally twisted it. Yeah, it was written to the Danbury Baptist. That's exactly right, uh, Karen. And they were worried about the government telling them what to do, how to worship. And so Thomas Jefferson wrote this. Jack, can you read that? Believing religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God that he owes account to none other for, the, for his faith or his worship, <laughs> that the legislative powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people, that their legislature would make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Does that sound familiar, by the way? Huh? Their legislature would make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof? Huh? That is in the Constitution. That is in the Constitution. And, and you see, one of the things that... Um, there's a clear wall of separation protecting churches from government, not protecting government from churches. The ACLU distorted Jefferson's words. And liberal courts eventually picked up on it. And they made rulings, basically, that were anti-religious, anti-Christian. But they've been dealt a blow lately, recently, haven't they? What happened in Maine? Go ahead, Karen. Uh, you're going to get, you got one gold star. You'll get right, my second one. Uh, for a number of years, the public schools have paid for high schoolers to go to private school in Maine because the population is so widespread. There are not enough available high schools. 
They could even go abroad to study. The only place they couldn't go was a Christian school. And our Supreme Court on the same week they did grow also said, you cannot choose this one thing to discriminate against. So their voucher system was discriminatory and the courts ruled against that. And so, so and, and the majority was six to three. Now in Washington state, anybody know what happened there? Yeah, go ahead, tell me about it. Well, at halftime, we were Joe Kennedy is his name. Yeah, after the game, we were in 50 yard line and he got fired for doing that, actually. And the Supreme Court said, no, he can't do that. He can't play great after the game and the 50 yard line. Again, in a six to three vote, the coach's prayer has been protected and he's been reinstated. I can't hear you, Marvin. Say, Say that again. You don't revolt before it's ever taken in, in the Supreme Court anymore. You know, six to three, six to three. Every, everyone will vote you six to three. Well, so far it's been six to three, but I have to tell you that even the Roe v. Wade case would have, if Ruth Bader Ginsburg were there, would have still been six to three because she was, she was certainly a supportive of abortion but she didn't think it, it was based on a good precedent, wasn't based on good law, and therefore should go back to the states. But anyway, Craig DeBroach, uh, he's the CEO of the uh, president of Family um, Alliance, Policy Alliance, and, and he said this. Jack, can you read that? Today's decision is a monumental victory, not only for Coach Kennedy, but for every American who wants to live their faith. The U.S. Constitution has never and will never require Americans to abandon their faith. We applaud the six justices of the Supreme Court who today firmly upheld that truth. Amen. But I digress. You know, what's interesting about it is that uh, recently a classmate of uh, somebody in this room uh, um, as a judge um, put a stay on, they, uh, Kentucky had a trigger law and the trigger law said that uh, abortion would be banned if Roe v. Wade was overturned. And it was overturned. Uh, the trigger law was to go into effect, but the judge put a stay on it, stopped it. And that went to the Supreme Court. David, uh, David uh, Cameron, is that his name? The, the Attorney General? Daniel, Daniel Cameron. Daniel Cameron. Uh, um, I, and that's right. I get my kids and, and grandkids' names mixed up all the time. I got, I call David Dan and Dan David and all that stuff. So anyway, da Daniel Cameron uh, filed suit, went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court upheld the judge's stay. So now it will be a protracted, I'm guessing it will be a protracted battle. Um, so um, if you have a voice, um, write to some of your congressmen and senators in Kentucky. But again, I digress. Um, I don't want to get too much into politics, but that's not politics. That's life or death. And that's an issue of murder. And I'm not ashamed to stand up here and say it's wrong. And we need to move forward. We are a lot bigger majority than a few judges, right? I'm not suggesting that we pick at their homes. But what I am suggesting is that we write letters and take advantage of our rights and our freedom to speak uh, as Americans. Amen. Now, David wanted to make sure that he had everything according to God's word and his will. So in 1 Chronicle 15, it tells us that he pulled together nearly 900 Levites and priests, and, and David also tells them the correct way to, to carry the ark, 1 Chronicles 15, 11 through 14. Then David <laughs> summoned Zadok and Abiathar the priests, and Uriel, Asaiah, Joel, Shemaiah, Eliel, and Abinadab the Levites. <laughs> He I said, love it. I, I, I love it when Jack has to read those names. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Sometimes I listen to professional readers to, to make sure I'm getting it right. The professional readers don't even agree. <laughs> That's true. So just consider the fact if you disagree with me that I come from Louisville. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jack. <laughs> he said to them, you're the heads of the Levitical families. You and your fellow Levites are to consecrate yourselves and bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place I have prepared for it. 
it was because of you, the Levites, uh, did not bring it up the first time that the Lord our God broke out in his anger against us. We did not inquire of him about how to do it in the prescribed way. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves in order to bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, what's interesting about it, that's why I say I'm pretty sure that David got the message and understood it somehow, and I'm sure God spoke to him in some way. But, 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 but what I find interesting here is that God pays attention to the details, doesn't he? He's pretty precise, isn't he? See, a lot of times we forget that, but God pays attention. He sees and he pays attention to the details. So secondly, David enters the city and he's dancing before the ark and he gathers people together to worship and to fellowship and to eat together. And really that angers Michael, his wife. Second Samuel uh, 6, uh, 12b to 15, Jack. So David went down and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. David, wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all his might, while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of trumpets. All right, so David is wearing a, 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 a linen ephod. It, meaning David was not dressed as a king, right? He didn't have royal robes on. He took them off and he humbled himself in worship to the real king. And he put on, he put on or put on what the priests and the Levites had. They were wearing the same thing. And he put aside his royal robes and, and he really dressed like the rest of the priests and the Levites. And, and I think there's a little bit of a debate. I think the debate is wrong. It, it, it was probably not immodestly as some people, you know, people say he danced naked before the Lord. More than likely it's not. In fact, in First Chronicles, it tells us that he was wearing the same clothing as the Levites. First Chronicles 15, 27. Now David was clothed in a robe of fine linen, as were all the Levites who were carrying the ark, and as were the singers and Kenaiah, who was in charge of the singing of the choirs. David also wore a linen ephod. So, so you know, this is a joyful occasion, and, and David is dancing in a joyful <laughs> occasion, and, and it's a parade of sorts, and, and dancing's appropriate here. Where this idea came from that he was dancing naked before the Lord, I, I, I have no idea, but that, that, is not a, that is not a small amount of debate associated with that. There's a large amount of debate associated with that, but it's pretty clear in Scripture that he was clothed, and he's wearing a linen ephod, and Michael was upset when she sees him dancing and how he's dressed, and she doesn't like it because it's not dignified enough. It's not kingly. Second Samuel um, 6, verses 16 through 19, Jack. As the Ark of the Covenant was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window, and when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women and all the people went to their homes. So she's probably assuming here or thinking here, you know, look at that. His actions aren't very kingly. He's not distinguishing himself. Or maybe he was distinguishing himself, but in the wrong way, in her opinion. Spurgeon weighed in on this. Uh, can you read that, Jack? No doubt there are particularly nice and dainty people who will censure God's chosen if they, enthusiastic, if they live enthusiastically to his praise and they will call them eccentric, obstinate, absurd, and I don't know what else. From the window of their superiority, they look down upon us. I really like Spurgeon, even though he smokes cigars. By the way, did you know that, John? <laughs> but but he, he certainly is. Have you ever experienced people who are critical of hand-raising, enthusiastic praise? How many people in here have ever raised their hands in praise? Yeah, most people. Sometimes I raise both of them, okay? 
Now, now let's let's put that aside for me. Go ahead, Marvin. You don't raise your hands. Yeah. I'm I, 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 I'm going to look for you. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, if you look in scripture, it's mentioned eight or nine times, depending on your. Uh, Lift your hands in praise. Yeah. I mean, it's not uncommon at all. Well, let's put that aside for a minute. I want to ask another question about <laughs> expressive worship. When does expressive worship, where does that stop and it starts to become over the top, a rock concert? Yeah. I, when does it cease to be worship and when does it start to be a rock concert? When the attention is drawn off of God and his glory and drawn on to the uh, individual who's trying to be seen. Here's what A.W. Tozer said. I like Tozer, too. Worship is no longer worship when it reflects the culture around us more than the Christ within us. Isn't that true? It's true. Tozer's got a way of just hitting the nail on the head. Any of you ever read Tozer? I know, Alvin, you've read Tozer. He, he's just got a way of, of expressing himself in simple terms, but he hits the nail on the head. It, it, I was listening to another, I was looking at another blog post by uh, Tom McKenzie, and he wrote this. Jack, can you read this? Do you like that purple, by the way? Rock concerts are designed to give you an emotional experience. Everything works together to entertain you. They want to make you feel good, euphoric. You should have fun, and you should want to buy more product. Worship of God is not about fun, good feelings, entertainment, or euphoria. Worship is laying down our lives, honoring the God who died for us, and receiving his grace. That has nothing to do with rock concerts. When rock concerts and worship services are indistinguishable, then we're, all, uh, we're of this world, not just in it. What do you think about that? Go ahead. Uh, tell me. But specifically, how my dad came to Christ. How'd your dad come to Christ? He went to a striper concert with my mom. He went to a striper concert. Yeah. But that wasn't a worship service, but it was a striper concert. And and what happened? Uh, realized that uh, kind of in ironic sense here. Um, realized that uh, uh, worship or uh, music can be. Well, it can be absolutely. But let me hear the rest of it. One thing that that struck me was always reluctant to raise my hands. When the place would erase you, what do you do? It's a sign of submission, yeah. and that's the way I look at raising my hands. It's submission, not raising, not drawing attention to myself. <laughs> it, it is a position of submission, and I, I have no problems with that. I raise my hand, raise both of them. Okay, raise my head, do all kinds of stuff. I don't jump up and down, but that's because I get tired. <laughs> All right, how about the rest of you? Anybody else have an opinion on this? Well, I know most many of you have opinions on this because I've heard from you before. <laughs> Maggie. Well, I think a lot of it can be with the words that, that are being sung in worship. Some of them are directed at him, and some of them are saying, ah, ah, me, me, me. Yeah, that's well, well, that's absolutely true. Go ahead. Tony. I remember way back when my... My kids were introduced to Christian rock, the bands like White Heart and Petra and all these things. And I remember Karen and I having a friend, oh, is this of the devil or is this, you know, all that yeah. sort of that. Probably a lot of parents in here went through that trauma of trying to figure out if this was okay. And we've come to the, to the very uh, strong conclusion that uh, the result that it had in my kids was worship. And a lot of the, the, the lyrics were fantastic uh, from, the, from these Christian bands. And it, it was able to meet a group of people with the truth of God in a way that was, was true and righteous and good. Well, let me ask you then. Worship is no longer worship when it reflects the culture around us more than the Christ within us. Is, is, you know, uh, is toes are all wet? Yeah, I think, I think it's interpreted as to whether or not it encourages Christ within us. Right. You know, if it encourages Christ within us, there's a lot of things in the culture that can't do that. I but, look at the and there are a lot of things nature. in the culture. Yeah, there are a lot of things in the culture that can't do that. Sure. You know, yeah. But, but yeah, go ahead. This is a tough, tough issue, and it's been around forever. Being a former worship leader, I can tell you that 
the problem is, as we got more into this, the church began to decline more. And there's so many uh, situations, and I've been to Evangel Tabernacle. If you're an evangel person, don't be offended by this, but from uh, 50 years ago, and it was rock and roll, good time rock and roll, and after the service, there was no holiness in the people that were involved in this. And because I knew a lot of them. And the, and there was a there was a show, but there was no redemption, there was no holiness uh, evolved from this experience. And I know it's used here at Southeast to attract a new a generation of people, and I don't have a negative feeling about it. I don't enjoy it, but we've got to be so careful because we're we're dealing with something that is so uh, important to God, yeah. our worship experience. And when we uh, have people up on the stage <clears throat> that are not filled with the Holy Spirit, and I don't care if they're singing just as I am or if they're doing a rock and roll deal like we do now, if they're not, if the Holy Spirit's not leading that experience and they go out and their lifestyle it doesn't reflect Christ life, we got a big, big problem. Well, let me come back here. What do you think it was that 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 attracted your dad? What is it that that uh, drew him to the Lord? I, I'm not entirely sure, but um, one thing that comes to mind is you mentioned the phrase of the devil, I'm wondering if that kind of mentality was that words was kind of the message that he got from was this in the quote here of the devil oh, okay okay what you said it's just this kind of mentality of like two one or one and a half generations ago. um <clears throat> or two or two yeah <laughs> um and i think he might have been kind of black and white about it a lot of us are kind of black and white about it is this allowed us for this Lord? Is this is this going to um, encourage the Holy Spirit when you come from that world? Um, well, 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 look at Alice Cooper. And he's a, <laughs> 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 okay. He would no, he was a, he was a big rock guy, he used to paint himself up and all kinds of things. Someone else, yeah. so I know that Carly and I are going to agree with me, but I can say I can go and sing hymns, which I know more of you would probably be more comfortable with. But I, I try to think of it this way our ancestors didn't sing hymns, they didn't sing the music of your time, they sang something else. So each generation has gradually changed if you believe it or not, with the culture of music. So I definitely think it's a heart thing, 100%. Is your heart in the right place? Because music has evolved since the beginning of time. And so for me, worship is very, very personal. And um, I can sing the hymns, or I can go in and sing what we sing today in service. And I used to feel very uncomfortable and shy about raising my hands because I felt like the spotlight was down on me. You know, everybody's looking at me. And then I came to the conclusion one time when God filled me with the Holy Spirit with a certain song, it just became natural. And now I don't even think about who's looking at me who's not looking at me because it's God who I'm praising. And so I think we have to put aside of our likes and dislikes and wonder where somebody's heart is in that. Well, music is certainly preferential. And, and, and it's and it and it is a method to an end and so what's really important is to check the ends and to make sure that happens someone had their hand up over here yeah tony yeah I enjoy worship music, and sometimes you feel the Holy Spirit. I can even I want to raise my hand sometimes, but it's because the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit. It's work. not because of the culture. I, I would, I would, well, except for the fact that that we don't also have to always mirror the culture in our churches. So sometimes the culture does have an adverse influence. The culture has had an adverse influence. 
when the church's pulpits are silent about abortion, which is murder. So, you know, there are, I, I get what you're saying, and it's important to be aware, to understand that not everybody enjoys the same music, but the focus of the music should be on worship. Yeah, Glenn. Again, it's the intent. Hillsong, for example, knew that there were certain rhythms and chord progressions that they could play. Strike a strong emotional response so they could then sell their stuff. That's right. And that was being used for the wrong reason. Yeah. And yet there were worship leaders with Hillsong who were dynamic Christians. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my, my, my son David is friends with a couple of them, including uh, what, what was her name? Kate Benningfield? Benningfield? Do, do you know who that is? Kate Benning, none of you ever heard of her? Yeah, what? I think she's Yeah. Uh, Tony and I like to support Christian music uh, movies when they come out. So maybe some of you did this last year. We went to the Jesus Music yeah. movie at Tinseltown, thinking it was going to be a worship. Uh -huh. <laughs> it wasn't. But it was the <laughs> history of music. It was Michael W. Smith and Amy Grant. But it was interesting. It's what we're talking about now that progression and how. So many people came to Jesus in the Jesus music through Christian music. And I think if I'm not speaking out of turn, that's how Rick Steinrock and Diane got saved. Uh, so God can use these things. But you know who was the first person to put them on stage? It was Billy Graham at a Billy Graham concert in yeah. Dallas. He either had, um, I don't know, it was Petra or what, but they were they were in it now some of those people are not walking with the lord some are but it's an interesting thing you want to look for it on netflix or something it's called christian well well billy graham um, when uh, i i was i worked with the billy graham crusade when they were here and they had third day but they also had uh michael tate uh who at the time was was a rapper uh so but the, the point in all this is and i don't want to spend too much time on it but the point in all this is it's important to take a look at the music, the worship service, all of it. And it's important to make decisions not based on the culture as much as it is on what are we trying to do here? How are we trying to, uh, I'll tell you, Greg Allen used to do a good job of this. He, he would focus on, okay, how do we uh, bring that spirit of worship to the table here? How do we create conditions for the spirit to work in people's hearts? And sometimes, it's a little bit more difficult than in others. Tony, one, one last comment on this. Yeah, I mean, I say, when the Holy Spirit is, is moving and you can feel it, and, and I, I, then it's a natural progressive praise, raise your hand in submission. Now, but when I'm being told from the stage <laughs> to raise my hands, when I'm being told, I don't think that's, that's the culture. That's not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> All right, well, interesting discussion. So David knows what the problem is here, why she's mad. 2 Samuel 6, 21, 22. David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone else from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. Now look what happens here in verse 23. Go ahead, Jack, read that. And Michael, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Now let me ask you a question here. Was it the Lord or was it Michael's unrequited love from David who was punishing her? What do you think it was? Was it the Lord not allowing her to have children, or was it David not allowing her to have children? That might be hard to know because up until now, I, I, I first thought, well, David just quit sleeping with her, and so she had no children. But but they've been married a long time, and it's been some years since. since well, they've been married a long her. time, but they weren't really married a long time. Well, 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 my question is, why did David go and get her back from her husband? He told Abner, okay, Abner, we'll get together here, but I want my wife back. Because she was Saul's daughter, and that makes a difference. That, that legitimizes 
to the public that he should be king if if he needed legitimization. See, Saul took her away from David to begin with. Uh, and he was trying to block any claim that David had to the throne. And, and that's why after Saul died, David reclaimed her from Abner. Her lineage solidified his claim to the throne. So it might have been a little bit of both, but I think it was, it was, it may have been David, but he still wanted her because here I'm king and the king gave me his daughter. So the, the marriage was primarily a political alliance. Well, well next David makes a promise. Uh, God makes a promise to David through Nathan, after which David prays. So God settles, settles David comfortably, but David's troubled about something. Second Samuel 7, 1 through 3. After the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, here I am living in a palace of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, whatever you have in your mind, go ahead and do it for the Lord is with you. So Nathan tells him, go ahead. God's with you. You're okay. David has a nice house, uh, but the ark and, and God's presence are still in a tent. Uh, and, and he means by a tent, of course, the tabernacle. And Nathan tells him to go ahead. But that was a bit premature. And, and, and we see here God speak to Nathan, 2 Samuel 7, 4 through 7. Jack. That night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, go and tell my servant, David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I've not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I've been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? So God, God basically tells him, I don't need a house. I'm not looking for a house. I didn't ask you for a house. But he does it gracefully, at least more graciously than I just said. And, and as a result, David doesn't despair of this. On the contrary, 1 Chronicles 29 tells us that David gathered up, he became a fundraiser, didn't he? And, and he gathered up all the materials and all the money, and Solomon built the temple. And then the next verses, God tells, and God both reminds David and promises him several things. He said, I, I took you from being a shepherd in the field to being ruler over my people. I have been with you. I cut off all your enemies. I'll make your name great. And then he says, I'll give you my people a home and give you rest from all your enemies. I will give you a house. I will give you an heir. And when he does wrong, I'll punish him. But my love will never be taken away from him like it was with Saul. And your throne will be established forever. Now, we find out later why God didn't want David to build a temple in 1 Chronicles 22, 8 through 10. Jack? I'll have to find that one. You didn't, I don't think you gave that one to me. Okay, I may have missed that. 1 Chronicles 22, 8 through 10. If you want to look it up, you can find it there. <laughs> okay, I got it now. Okay. But this word of the Lord came to me. You have shed much blood and have fought many wars. You are not to build a house for my name because... You have shed much blood on the earth in my sight, but you will have a son who will be a man of peace and rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies on every side. His name will be Solomon, and I will grant Israel peace and quiet during his reign. He is the one who will build a house for my name. He will be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. So David is overwhelmed by this. And he comes to God in prayer. Take a look at his prayer, 2 Samuel 7, 18 through 22, Jack. It's a beautiful, heartfelt prayer of thanksgiving and praise. 2 Samuel 7. <laughs> 7, 18 through 22. 22. Okay, here we go. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O sovereign Lord? And what is my family? 
that you have brought me to brought me this far. And as if this were not enough in your sight, O sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant. Is this your usual way of dealing with man, O sovereign Lord? What more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O sovereign Lord. For the sake of your word and according to your will, you have done this great thing and made it known to your servant. How great you are, O sovereign Lord. There's no one like you, and there is no God but you, as we have heard, heard with our own ears. How many times has David said, O sovereign, law, uh, sovereign Lord, in that prayer? Multiple times. What, what's his point? <laughs> Drink every time you hear that one. <laughs> no, I don't think so. What's his point there? Look, God is sovereign. And, and just as God doesn't want him to build a temple, in God's sovereignty, he wants his son to build a temple. And God has been good to him, and he's acknowledging that God has been good to him. Well, finally, we see God delivers on his promises. In the first eight verses of chapter eight, we see God give David multiple military victories. He, he conquered the Philistines, the Moabites, the Syrian alliance. And in the first verse, it says that David went to recover territory by the Euphrates River. And this is one of the property lines that God had drawn originally uh, with Abraham in Genesis. So, so God also gave a reputation and some glory to David's kingdom. 2 Samuel 8, 9 through 14, Jack. When too, king of Hamath heard that David had defeated the entire army of Hadad Azer, he sent his son Joram to King David to greet him and congratulate him on his victory in battle over Hadad Azer, who had been at war with two. Joram brought him articles of silver and gold and bronze. King David dedicated these articles to the Lord as he had done with the silver and gold from all the nations he had subdued, Edom and Moab, the Ammonites and the Philistines and Amalek. He also dedicated the plunder taken from Hadad Ezer, son of Rehob, king of Zobah. And David became famous after he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. He put garrisons throughout Edom, and all the Edomites became subject to David. The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. So, so Hadad Ezer, who was the king of Zobah, uh, with his defeat, David captured 1,700 horsemen and 20,000 foot soldiers, foot soldiers. That's in verse 3 and 4 of 2 Samuel 8. David also hamstrung the chariot horses, okay? Why did he do that? Why did he hamstring all those chariot horses? I wondered that, but I think it might be because God said don't trust in horses. Well, and, and, and the, the other element of this is he doesn't want anybody to be able to mount up an army and come after him again. But he reserved enough, a hundred chariots. Uh, in addition, David took the gold shields from the officers and, and brought them to Jerusalem. Now, let me ask, how does David strike down and capture 22,000 Syrians, 21,700 horsemen, and soldiers of Hadadezer's army and 18,000 Edomites. How does he do that? How did he do that? God with the four even did it. Absolutely. The God who goes before us. God, God certainly was with him, and I believe he, he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. See, when God took the spirit off of Saul, what, what did he do with that spirit? Huh? He put it on David. You know, I was thinking about, well, I want some clarification on how this works, okay? Because I feel moved by the Spirit sometimes, but I haven't been moved to kill 60,000 people or, or to rule a kingdom, although that'd be kind of fun. But, but I, I found this by Dr. Charles Stanley. And by the way, he announced his retirement, uh, which is interesting. Jack, can you read that? Spiritual power is the divine energy God is willing to express in and through us and the divine authority needed to carry out the work God has called us to do. We experience his power when we surrender to be used by him. 
God releases his power through us as we walk in obedience to him. Anybody in here ever been empowered to do something that you didn't think you could ever do? Anybody in here? Think about that. Has the Holy Spirit empowered you to do something that you never thought you could do? Gigi. Uh, taking my statistics class, it was like free to me, and I prayed, and all of a sudden I went, oh, I get it. And I, I know it was the Holy Spirit who empowered me to have and you did that with anatomy as well, right? Well, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I can remember you praying, all right, God, you created this stuff. You got an unlimited mind. Please enlighten mine. And, and we can do that. We have access to that power. Why don't we use it enough? Why aren't we more powerful? We don't think it, it's a lack of faith, isn't it? We don't think it'll really... Take a look at Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. Jack, real quickly. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. He wants to strengthen us with his power in our inner being. How many of you want that? How many of you want that? Just a few of you? All right, go ahead, Jack, continue. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being, up, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and how long and, and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. See, God, this is not a surfacing. God wants to get inside of us. He wants to get deep inside of us. He wants to strengthen us with his Holy Spirit. He wants to give us power. And that's really where our real identity is, isn't it? As, as we yield to him, he can change us. But not only change us, he can empower us with real power. And that usually comes as our hearts submit to God in prayer and then in our actions. And notice, too, that God promises to strengthen us with his power through the Holy Spirit. Well, what does that mean? What is Holy Spirit power? You ever thought about that? Well, think about this. Because the Holy Spirit is God, right? He's the third person of the Trinity, right? Everybody agree with that? Okay. The Holy Spirit administers the power of God. Think about that. The Holy Spirit then comforts us. The Holy Spirit teaches us. The Holy Spirit convicts us. The Holy Spirit leads us. The Holy Spirit empowers us. The Holy Spirit enlightens us. And that's the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. The same Holy Spirit that empowered the disciples in the upper room. The same Holy Spirit that empowered Peter and the disciples at Pentecost. The same Holy Spirit that empowered Paul to write most of the New Testament and Peter to heal a lame person. You see, God's intention is to strengthen us, strengthen each of us with that kind of power through the Holy Spirit. So I think, Jerry, you're right. Sometimes we don't believe that the Holy Spirit can empower us, don't we? Terry. And I believe it, but I think a lot of times I get in the habit of figuring out on my own and not turning and asking the Holy Spirit like I should. Nothing is impossible with God. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm wondering if we're also expecting or anticipating the work of the Holy Spirit to work through faith. Um, and notice with others where a lot of times it's the same miracle. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sometimes we do expect great things, and, and, and in fact, oftentimes God uses us to be able to perform miraculous actions, okay? Well, let's take a look finally. Holy Spirit's a gift to each and every one of us. Do, do you get that? It, it's our seal and our guarantee. Our guarantee of inheritance, Ephesians 1, 13, 14, Jack, real quickly. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, 
the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Well, what about the seal? What does that mean? The, the Greek word for seal is shragizo, okay? What does that mean? It means to mark with a seal, to guarantee a document, to identify ownership, or to protect from tampering. So, so the Holy Spirit guarantees that we're children of God, and the seal marks us as truly belonging to God. Romans 8, 9 through 11. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. So when we receive Christ as our personal savior, we also receive the Holy Spirit. And it says in Ephesians 1.13, if we don't have the Spirit, we don't have, we don't have Christ. So Christ gives us the Holy Spirit when we are saved. Now, the Holy Spirit teaches us, comforts us. What's interesting about this is that we are marked with a seal. Each one of us who have committed our lives to Christ are marked with a seal. Okay? You get that? Do you believe that? We're marked with a seal. And that seal is a guarantee... A guarantee of what? A guarantee of our authenticity, a guarantee of our promises in the future, a guarantee that we are children of God. See, it, it identifies our ownership, okay? What do I mean by that? Well, we are owned not by ourselves, but by Jesus Christ, are we not? What did Paul say? That, that, that he is no longer a slave to sin, but a slave of Jesus Christ? And Jesus Christ and him crucified. So we are owned by Jesus Christ. And that protects us from tampering. Is not God good? Yeah. See, I, I would love to see a move, a real moving of the spirit in here where God moves us not only to worship him, but God moves us in a mighty way to perform incredible acts, just like the disciples did. We can do it. And we can, we can move in people's lives. Well, 2 Samuel 8 concludes by David describing, um, and, and by describing David's officials. But there's one verse that tells us, and I'll close with this, a great deal about David. 2 Samuel 8, 15. Can you read that, Jack? David reigned over all Israel, doing what was just and right for all his people. See, he treated his people with justice and fairness. Now, that's quite a contrast to Saul. And it was, quite frankly, it was a contrast to all of the kings of Israel. Because all of the kings, as you study, as Bart brings that to the table, you're going to find out that all of the kings did evil in the sight of the Lord. Only five kings from Judah did righteousness in the sight of the Lord. And the Bible tells us that they did evil. What does it tell you about David? So do you believe in the Holy Spirit and you really believe? Do you believe he will and can and will empower you? Do, do you believe he can teach and comfort you? Do you believe that in yielding yourself to God, the Holy Spirit will help you become one as unto the Lord?